Hi, my name is Alana. Welcome to my YouTube channel. On this channel, we review books. And today's review is a book that I read back in like, I think July. I read this in July. Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. This is a fantasy. I'm not a massive fantasy. But let's try that again. Maybe if I were a little bit more delicate. I'm not... This is what happens, sorry. This is what happens when you have multiple holes in your ear and stuff just getting tangled up in all of the hoops that are lined back here. Okay. I'm not a big fantasy reader. Not because I don't like it. I'm just particular about my fantasy. I'm not a... I like... I'm picky. Like, I don't like super high fantasy to the point where I'm confused. So, yeah. This... This book... Spoiler alert, I loved it. This was such a good read for me. Let's dive in. Most prisons are of our own making. A man makes his own freedom. In Assassin's Apprentice, okay, we're introduced to a main character and our narr narrator, whose name is Fitz. So it's the kingdom of the six duchies, and Fitz is the bastard son of the crown prince. Both father and son are ostracized for this shock horror, and... <laughs> Though the difference is that Fitz is being is sent to the stables while his father does get to be exiled in way more comfortable lodgings, but he is exiled nonetheless. And Fitz, we also learn, has a natural affinity towards animals. He can sense their thoughts, though in time he learns that the skill, which is what this is called, is blasphemous in this fantastical world. The six duchies are also on the verge of civil war because we have, of course, the six duchies we have political factions. We have, um, like, so Fitz's father does have other brothers. And so there are political factions where people in this particular kingdom may favor one prince over the other. So the king does end up deciding to use Fitz to his political advantage by trading him to be an assassin and a seer, which is, this is also called the Farseer Trilogy. And his tutor, so the person who he's training under will end up being trained under to be a seer is actually loyal to a different political faction and wants Fitz dead. Um, Fitz is also trained to be an assassin. He's under, he's, so Fitz is going under training to be an assassin. That's top secret. Only the king and Fitz and his tutor for that know that, but then he's also under another tutor to be a seer. So, so Fitz is narrating the story as an older man, reflecting on his life, and he begins with himself as a small child. Memory is a theme. I would say memory is the theme that permeates this entire narrative. How does memory fluctuate over the years and what influences how we retain our memories? The more I read, I think, I think the more um, that I realize that most narratives are about the retention of memory. It might be the most common theme in literature that I've come across, other than maybe love. Maybe love and memory are the two most common themes. Not that I mind. Like, I, I never get tired of how an author, each author, tackles memory. My memories reach back to when I was six years old. Before that, there was nothing, only a blank gulf only a blank gulf no exercise of my mind has ever been able to pierce but on that day they suddenly begin with a brightness and detail that overwhelms me sometimes it seems too complete and I wonder if it is truly mine am I recalling it from my own mind or from a dozen of retellings perhaps I have heard the story so many times from so many resources that I can that I now recall it as an actual memory of my own the artless curl of a strand of a woman's hair left on my pillow or the trail of a man's heel left in sand as we dragged bodies from the smoldering tower at Seal Bay, the track of a tear down a mother's cheek as she clutched her foraged infant to her despite his angry cries. Like red ships, the memories come without warning, without mercy. Also, those two quotes show just how great of a writer technically Hobb is because this, the second quote in particular is an excerpt from a whole paragraph, one of the best written paragraphs in the whole novel. This woman can write. Let's move on. <laughs> Due to Fitz's station in life, you know, unfortunately being an unwanted out of woodlock child, he is 
able to be manipulated easily. He has no free will. And so we're going to talk about free will in a little bit, but the keys also, he's unfortunately pulled into the King's political games. And so Fitz's narration does add commentary about the rule of government and its intended purposes versus how it actually typically spans out. <laughs> Corruption is bound to happen when personal and political greed coupled with the pers the preservation of old power come into play. So you have, of course, the King who wants to preserve his own line. He wants his line to be in control. And so he's doing what he has to do to keep that power. So, but again, this is an entity, this is a, the six duchies are on the verge of civil war. And so we have shifting loyalties and portrayals that are going to be inevitable. And of course, this is only the first of three. So this is going to pan out, obviously, in the remainder of the series. That is the trick of good government, to make folk desire to live in such a way that there is no need for its intervention. What does the devouring of one man matter if it saves a kingdom? And again, like I mentioned about free will, within this political game, Fitz's own free will is lacking. And he learns at a young age that as the king's pawn, his he doesn't have a whole lot of agency. I thought of the hounds in their kennels instead, or of the hawk, hooded and strapped, that rode on the king's wrist and was loosed only to do the king's will. And so with this lack of agency or this lack of free will, you have who, not only that, he's technically the grandson, a grandson of the king. Fitz is constantly or often questioning this idea of inevitability. So he, you can't help where you're born to or where you're born or you know who's your, who you're born to. He had no control over being born out of wedlock to a prince. Not only, not just any prince, the prince who was next in line to be king. And so he's questioning, maybe I was born for a reason at this time. It was inevitable for me to be drawn into these, into this, this environment that I was in and into these political games that I was in. Tides wait for no man. And that I know is true, but time, did the times I was born into await my birth to be? Did the events rumble into place like the great wooden gears of the clock, meshing with my conception and pushing my life along? That's actually where I'm going to wrap this up for the most part. I think that Assassin's Apprentice is exactly what I look for in a fantasy novel. It's fantastical without being so complex that the world build, building is confusing and convoluted. There are a couple of um, fantasy novels that I've thought about wanting to read. I forgot the name of the guy, I, the author's name. I think his first name starts is Brian. I can't remember his last name. And when I looked at reviews, I was like, bruh, doing too much. I don't want to think like that. <laughs> um, not, when I'm, not when it comes to fantasy for me. And so I know that this is also the first installment of a trilogy. So a lot of the fantastical elements in this world haven't fully come into, haven't fully been fleshed out yet. We're getting a taste of it here. And this is the thinnest, it's not a long book at all. It's 300 and something pages. But the other two in this, in this trilogy, they're chunkers. So I'm curious to see how Hobb fleshes the rest of this world out. Again, this also isn't a deep novel. It's kind of like Game of Thrones. It's just fun to read. It's political intrigue. It's drama. It's backstabbing. It's portrayal that you want to read in a novel like this. And I also found that the writing was very engaging. Hobb is an excellent writer. It's also fun to read. There are times where I chuckled. There are times Fitz as a character. I found Fitz to be, in I love me some Fitz. Fitz was incredibly endearing, especially his relationship with animals and dogs in particular. Um, the dogs get a shout out in this, in this book. All right. If you're a dog lover, it's both, it's both comforting and kind of sad. To be honest, some of these dogs don't end up, uh, yeah, <laughs> they go through as well. I couldn't put the book down. I couldn't, I was, I, I read it in maybe a week, week and a half. And, um, when I finished the book, I had a hard time telling myself, to 
trying to motivate myself to move on to the next book. What did I read after this one? I can't remember what I picked up after this, but um, I almost immediately went to the second book, but I had to tell myself no. I am going to wrap it up with a quote from George R.R. R. Martin. I think he kind of summed up Hobbes, Hobbes' place in the fantasy fiction world well. And he said, and it's also a quote that's on the cover of this book. In today's crowded fantasy market, Robin Hobbes' books are like diamonds in a sea of zircons. I mean, he put his stamp of approval on it. Chef's Kiss. I gave this a four and a half out of five. I really, really liked it. And I think that's it. Have you read Assassin's Apprentice? Have you read the whole trilogy? I also know there are several books after this. Have you read all of them? I think it's like nine or something like that total where different characters end up in different trilogies and stuff like that. So I'm going to just stick with this trilogy for now. Might dive into some of her other stuff later, but I'm just going to focus on this trilogy and see how I get on with the remainder of it. And let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Also feel free to like and subscribe and follow me on Instagram where I get up to more book shenanigans. And I tend to post, not I tend to, I do post all of my book content there first before it trickles over to YouTube. YouTube is way behind. Okay. So if you want to see what I'm up to in the Instagrams, please feel free to follow me there and I will see you in the next one.